And so I'm going to talk to you about two things very briefly. I'm keeping you from dinner, so uh, that's not a good thing for a speaker to do. Um, but you can't go to dinner yet, so we'll make it plenty of time. Look, I was deeply moved by Mario's, uh, by Mario Capecchi's story. My own father-in-law went through that. And I was sitting there kind of crying in the audience. <laughs> I couldn't believe it. Um, and then I'm also a, a father with a kid with a, a severe disability. So I, I just bonded with all the prior speakers. I can't tell you, it's crazy. Um, so as you heard, I've had some success developing with my colleagues four FDA approved drugs for neurodegenerative diseases, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's. They don't cure the disease, I'm the first to tell you. Uh, but they have made, you know, starting in a 500 square foot room, they've made millions of people's lives better. And then we realized, and this came out in a question I had asked earlier, that at the extremes of life, there are certain vulnerabilities that are very similar. So we looked at some of these drugs now in autism spectrum disorders, um, and I've actually discovered one of the genes that is responsible. And I'll tell you a little bit about that story today. I think for mentees that are in the audience, it kind of shows you how I got from one place to another. Um, so I'm gonna talk about particularly MDA type glutamate receptor antagonists, and then I'll talk a little bit about MEF2 transcription factors, which we discovered a number of years ago, and how they're important in multiple forms of autism. Um, they, they are one of the genes involved in autism, but they, form, uh, 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 they affect many other genes in autism. And I'll show you our forays into developing our treatments for that. Except it's not advancing. Oh, did it advance? Here we go. Okay, so, uh, you know, we haven't talked about this much at this meeting, uh, but there's a lot of evidence that there's excitatory inhibitory imbalance uh, in neurotransmission in autism spectrum disorder. Very interesting, it's recently been found in Alzheimer's disease. Again, those extremes of life, uh, where there's either too much E or too little I, that's too much glutamatergic signaling or too little inhibitory signaling. Uh, my timer seems to be on. I guess you really want me to get done quickly. Um, and so I'm gonna tell you about drugs that we have that can combat that EI. The one you probably all know, it, it's in a general class of drugs called amino adamantane. It's the one that's best known here in the US as, as memantine that came out of our group. It was originally an Eli Lilly drug that I discovered the mechanism of action at and patented it. And uh, Harvard, I was then at Harvard licensed the Forest Labs, now owned by AbV. And so that's known as Nemenda in this country, Abixa in Europe. Uh, and that actually normalizes EI in multiple, multiple models, and there's even um, evidence from gamma oscillations and other uh, EEG evidence that that actually occurs also in humans. So I'll tell you a bit about that, and I'll tell you about Gen 2 of those drugs, a greatly improved drug. Um, and I'll also mention a, a, a clinical uh, trial that's about to start with the original drug in a, in, a, um, in a pediatric formulation. Then I'll tell you a little bit about the transcription factor, specifically MEF2C, how it's involved in multiple forms of autism and intellectual disability and that boosting its activity, and this is very important, came out in multiple other talks, many talks, uh, um, is that you know, life is a bell curve, so is your activity. Allison showed this, all the speakers showed this. So it's not just true in Rett syndrome, it's true for MEF2C and many genes. You really don't wanna put in a drug that overactivates your gene, but we have a drug that will superactivate the remaining allele of MEF2C, so the overall activity is normal. And I'll show you a little bit about those drugs. Uh, the way we've come up with several of these drugs is, um, yeah, so I'm really privileged in life to be at Scripps Research now. Uh, there's an amazing chemist at Scripps Research, won the Nobel Prize two years in a row. Uh, just really amazing. Um, they've developed uh, what's called the Reframe Library. It's every drug on this planet that's made it through at least phase one trials. Um, and often we'll take those drugs or we'll make, uh, the chemists are so good, we'll make uh, small modifications of those drugs so we can get companies interested in them because now there's a patent and an IP portfolio. And I'll show you how we've used that to develop multiple MEF2 activators. Uh, and finally, I'll show you a little bit about how our MEF2 activator uh, corrects EI imbalance in human neurons. Okay, so let's start out with a little bit about MEF2C. I got into this field a little bit backwards. I discovered a transcription factor totally by mistake. I was looking for something else. Um, and it turned out to be critical in making nerve cells and certain innate immune cells, also B cells, particularly important in brain development, not just my lab, many labs have shown this. And basically it works as a transcription factor, it goes down and sits down and turns out target genes that are important in neuronal survival, um, also in microglial development in the CNS. Um, and so, you know, we did what all scientists do. We, we used Dr. Kopecky's technology and we knocked out the gene or we added more of it, okay? 
And interestingly, when we knocked it out, and we weren't expecting this, we had a mouse with many of the features of autism, all the typical tests of marble burying, social interactions. The, uh, we, the more tests we did, the more we realized it really looked like it. I called Huda Zagli at that point and sent her a little movie of the mouse. And uh, the mouse also had some of this, but males had it, not just females, which is a typical of Rett syndrome, hand wringing. And um, interestingly, she said she had just found that MEF2 was in the MECP2 pathway. So it kind of made sense uh, that this might be a gene. So we published that, and within about a year, uh, there were hundreds of cases of human MEF2C haploinsufficient to um, And I'll talk more about that in a minute. So what we, obviously you all know this, one in 36 cases now, uh, but you might not know this. So Dan Geshwin, my colleague who I um, collaborate with at UCLA, it's appropriate I collaborate with him since his uh, uncle Norm actually taught me neurology in Boston. Um, so MEF2C, there are not only rare case, relatively rare cases of MEF2C haploinsufficiency by gene mutation, but it's also a transcription factor uh, that's involved in many other forms of autism. And this is by Dan's work, and here's one slide from Dan's work, and he showed there are various hubs of genes involved in autism. I won't go through what the different hubs are, but you can see MEF2C actually and MEF2A also control many of them. So we've, we reasoned if we could get something that would work in a MEF2C model, it might also work at other forms of autism. And I'll show you, at least in our preclinical mouse studies, that turns out to be true. So let me tell you a little bit about MEF2C haploinsufficiency syndrome, since it's a relatively newcomer, although there, there's been now a, a recent um, a natural history study published um, with several hundred cases. Uh, so there's a, the gene obviously have to delete MEF2C, but we've worked uh, particularly on single point mutations because they're very tractable to CRISPR-Cas9. We can correct them and make iPS cells. We have multiple sets from patients with their isogenic wild-type control. Now, this is quite interesting. If you look for presumptive pathogenic variants in the UK biobank, uh, Nick Shork, a bioinformaticist at TGEM, did this for me. We find, remember, it's, on, it's not on an X, it's not on a sex link chromosome, so both males and females are affected. And there's between one in 1,000 and three in 1,000, so approximately 30-fold more prevalent than RET. Now, we don't know if that's true, but just looking at the SNPs, we believe that's going to be true. So uh, it's probably only rare because we weren't looking for it. Uh, and there's typical autistic behavior. Many of the children also have intellectual disability. Uh, many have epilepsy, but not all. Some have a tremor. Some have an abnormal EEG even without um, seizures. Uh, some do talk. I just have a patient in my practice now who talks very well. The diagnosis was actually made late. They were floored that it was a MEF2C haploinsufficiency. Uh, so quite a spectrum, uh, even in this one uh, genetic disorder. So disease models, um, like what you heard so eloquently from Allison, we also have IPS-based models, both 2D and cerebral organoids. We talked to Allison a lot, a lot. He's actually on, the, on, the, uh, on the, the PhD panel of one of my students. Um, and so we've made, with CRISPR-Cas9, as I said, uh, several isogenic wild-type controls that we can pair with our mutants. And we also have a, both a MEF2C conditional knockout and a MEF2C heterozygous knockout. Um, we have it conditional in the brain. We also have it all over the, uh, uh, throughout the body. And uh, that's actually been published. I'm not going to go over it today. But the drugs I'm going to talk to you about actually have worked in that model. It's published in Nature Communications a few years ago now. And I'll tell you a little bit about that drug in a minute. So this you heard, really heard from Allison. He's going to save me a lot of time, get you to dinner quickly. We use these disease and addition models. We make our IPS cells kind of the usual way. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this kind of just takes you through the disease, um, how the cells develop. <coughs> You've seen all these pictures from Allison. Okay, here's one that's different. When we um, have them by one month, or we, you know, we've grown them out to a year. <coughs> I wish I had some water. We find, interestingly, if you look at neuronal and astrocytic markers, uh, we knew MEF2C was important from our mouse work in development of neurons and in neural connections and synapses. And indeed, if you look at, say, GFAP staining, which could be astrocytic or radioglia, you see the MEF2C, there's very little MAP2, a neuronal marker. I don't know why it's jumping like this. And there's much more S100B, a legitimate astrocytic marker, in the MEF2C haploinsufficient cells here. I don't know why it's jumping. What have you done to me here? 
Uh, but anyway, so more, astro more astrocytes, fewer neurons, fewer connections as well. Um, we've done, uh, in, we've done the organoids uh, up to a little bit over a year. They form uh, rosettes, they form you know, multiple markers. I'm not gonna take the time to tell you, um, but they have migration the way we'd like them to. Oh, thank you so much for that, Robert. I see that coming. Um, we've done RNA-seq, I'll show you one in a minute. You know, I think rigor and reproducibility, I think the major thing you want to show is that the variability is not due from organoid to organoid variation, but by the real disease process. And we've been able to do that one way is single cell RNA-seq. And it's shown here, I know this is small and it's light in this room, so it's hard to see, but that turns out um, by postural criteria to be GABAergic cells. And here, the blue cells are meant to see the, uh, sorry, the blue are, um, yeah, are wild type. The pink are, or salmon are meth 2 c and you can see there's far fewer GABAergic neurons. These are three wild type and three organoids, and you can actually see we have the various cell types. I don't know why it's jumping. And you can immediately see that there's fewer um, GABAergic neurons quantifiably in the, uh, and um, that had been shown by other groups looking at meth 2 c and cortical development. Gord Fischel and others had shown that meth 2 c was particularly important. It is important in excitatory neurons, but particularly important in the uh, parvalbumin and gabaergic neurons. Okay, so I, I want to go, the, there's a lot of work I could show with MEA recordings and uh, other kinds of phenotypes, but this one's pretty striking. It's, oh, I'm sure it looks washed out because of the light coming in the room here. Hopefully you could see it. This is a normal organoid with calcium imaging, and you can see if I can get it to work, it should work. You know, they're, they're signaling, I, I, it's probably only appreciable in the front row, but this is a wild type, isogenic wild type organoid, and there's some signaling. Now you're gonna immediately see the difference even in the back of the room. Here's the MEF2C haploinsufficient organoid, much more activity, those are neuronal cell bodies you're seeing. You can see wild firing, and then we put on a drug called nitrosynapsin, make it normal. Okay, it was very, very quick. This is sped up about 20 times. The abnormal activity is due to glutamate, we can measure the glutamate. We can actually measure the glutamate in our human patients. I'll come back to that. It's elevated in the anterior cingulate, some other areas. So this is a new drug. It's actually based on memantine that I told you about, but it's a dual allosteric drug. It has two sites of action. One of the problems with memantine, this is the NMDA type channel. It binds in the channel. It's a proteated bridgehead amine that binds at or near the magnesium site. Um, our group uh, with colleagues at the volume have shown that in crystal structures. Um, but this is interesting. It has a little piece of nitroglycerin on the back of it. And the reason we did that is I had uh, discovered a biochemical reaction called protein S nitrosylation a number of years ago. If you haven't heard of it, you will. It's actually more ubiquitous than phosphorylation, just a lot harder to study. So um, papers are just coming out on it now. And the first protein I ever found that was nitrosylated was actually the NMDA receptor, although there's hundreds, thousands of proteins that are nitrosylated. Here we wanted to target aberrantly active NMDA receptors with our drug memantine-like, it's not quite memantine, and have a nitro group that goes and nitrosylates it, which further brings down aberrant activity. Now, the beauty of these drugs is they only work when you need them. They're pathologically activated. And the reason is the drug only moves into the channel when the channel's excessively open. And we've had multiple papers on this and others have shown it. They spare normal neurological synaptic activity. They only block excessive activity. And so you are going to hear tomorrow from a little company I founded, um, the scientific founder of Umentis. They're going to talk to you about a memantine trial that will start at Mass General using glutamate as a biomarker that can be sensed with a deconvolution of uh, MR spectroscopy by Yoshi Gagnon at the Department of Psychiatry at Mass General. So they've made a formulation of memantine. This will be the next gen, I think, because in our animal models and in our organoids, this actually works better than memantine, although we do get a memantine signal. This new drug, nitrosynapsin, works quite a bit better. Okay, so the current status of that, as I said, we published uh, the animal model. It's also worked in a TSC model, uh, a Rett syndrome model. Uh, so it works in more than one model, not just MEF2C. Uh, we're just finishing up some pre-IND studies that the FDA has asked for. It has excellent PK and availability in the brain. Um, we have financial support. Hopefully we'll start uh, this right after the memantine trial. And we have two sites, Mass General will be doing uh, higher functioning autism, and Wendy Chung at Boston uh, Children's Hospital, just moved, as Jeremy knows, from Columbia to Boston Children's, uh, is interested in doing a MEF2C children trial. 
Both of these will have biomarker endpoints. I think the one thing I learned going into drug discovery is you have to know how to kill a drug, not take it forward. So if the biomarker doesn't work in your kids, you've got to kill it, especially if they have a little company like Bi Umentis, because they only really get one shot on goal if it's going to go to the end. So I've had four shots on goal, and they all went in goal. I don't know how. I think I'm doing something a little different. All the drugs we make are these drugs that are pathologically activated therapeutics. Now, the initials there, I came up with this late one night, is a PAP, right, a gentle tap. Our drugs are actually fairly low affinity, but they only work when you need them to work. This is our target profile. You know, I'm running late, and you don't need to hear this, but we have a target profile with biomarkers uh, buried in here of how we're going to look at it in patients. I want to take uh, five minutes to tell you about the second strategy, particularly from F2C, but I think it'll work in others, because as I mentioned, the transcription factor in F2C does drive other genes involved uh, in autism. So in this case, we want to normalize the aberrant MEF2 activity. And we, we've looked at this very carefully in our isogenic versus uh, MEF2 haploinsufficient uh, IPS-derived neurons, and most of them have really about half the activity. So we wanted a drug that would just double the activity of MEF2, I would say a reporter gymnastic. So we carried out a high throughput screening with the Reframe Library and other libraries at Scripps to look for transcriptional activators. We've identified five candidates that, interestingly, have already been in people, several of them in advanced trials. And the beauty, I think, of our, all of these drugs have had some side effects, even though one of them is approved. But interestingly, we use about a tenth the dose that's needed because we can calibrate the dose to MEF2 activity. So this is the way we screen for them. Here we have MEF2 uh, hook. I told you what it did before. In this case, we hook it to a luciferase reporter. And uh, we, we screen the drugs very, very rapidly. Uh, we had a very good Z prime. You know, about 0.5 will work. And this is the, our lead compound right now. I'm just going to call it compound Y for, for IP reasons. If I tell you what it is, we can't get IP and we can't get a company to help us someday. Uh, so in this case, you can see we're down at one nanomolar that doubles the activity, right? Clinically, people take 5 to 50 nanomolar of this drug. So, you don't, so let me show you another one of those um, organoids with calcium imaging. This is a kid who had seizures. I think we've reproduced the seizure in the organoid. It's a child that lives in Rhode Island. And so we have quantified that here. You can see the spiking activity. And here we give compound Y. Oh, stop. And it's gone. So it can normalize the electrical activity. It also works on a multi-electrode array, but I, I, the calcium imaging is just visual and nice to see. Okay, so what I told you today is meth 2 haploinsufficiency syndrome and other forms of ASD that manifest this EI excitatory inhibitory imbalance. Um, we think there are ways um, to treat them either with MEF2 activators or NMDA receptor antagonists. Here's the kicker. I got a call from Lee Wei Sai, a close colleague of mine when I was in Boston that she was about to publish a paper, it's now published, that MEF2C activity, the opposite. It's a resilience in her centenarians. So if you have just slightly more MEF2C activity than normal, it's very unlikely you'll get Alzheimer's disease and you may live to 100. So in that case, our MEF2 activator drugs might be good in an older population. So she's testing them in multiple mouse models and we're testing them in the autism model. So we're very excited about this compound. Why? Although we do have backup compounds. Another really important thing you always want to have, you never know, even if the patient, even if the drug has been in people, you never know years out if there's still going to be an effect. So it's good to have backups. Uh, but we haven't seen any significant toxicity at this very low effect. This very low concentration, sorry. So I've had a lot of help. I'm not going to take the name to read them all here, but other labs, and I've just been so fortunate to have great mentors and um, you know, a lot of my former residents are in the audience here. I, uh, I'm really proud to see them. Um, and this is where we do it. It's a fantastic building right on the ocean in La Jolla. We welcome you to all come and maybe even uh, visit or work there. Thank you very much. And hopefully a minute for questions. <laughs>